Hello everyone and welcome back to Thursdev. I'm your host Luke and this week we're continuing in our balancing series with a deeper dive into macro balancing with another practical example. If you aren't already familiar with the concept of macro balancing or top down balancing, you may wish to check out last week's episode which goes over the general concepts a little bit more. If you are familiar with macro balancing, welcome. In this episode, we're going to do a short dive into a brand new build and battle game and look at how we went about establishing a reasonably balanced economy using the macro balancing method. I'm happy to say that this week I'll be using a real life example from my own work on Alpha Dog Games' most recent release, Monstrosity, of which I was the economy designer on top of a number of other things. As with the previous episode, this edition of Thursday is very math heavy and very spreadsheet centric. It may make for a slightly visually blander episode than usual, but behind every great game, there's a great big spreadsheet or two. And today, a large focus of our video will be in looking over the monstrosity progression balance worksheet that I created. Note, the values you'll see here are not all up to date. This is an actively evolving game and tweaks are being made frequently. The version you see here is from a few months ago, so some values will be inconsistent with what's in the game, but it should still serve to give you a pretty good idea of what's going on in the background to balance out our game. The most powerful monster in Monstrosity by far, this beast here was and is used to find a mathematically sound guideline for defining economy resource flow throughout the game. We have a similar sheet for DNA, monster stats, and many more, but this is the one with the most moving parts, because in the Build and Battler, in-game money makes the world go round. The first thing we did when establishing our game economy was to define our resources. Like most Build and Battlers, we chose to use two primary resource types, gold and power, which is analogous to perhaps gold and elixir in games like Clash of Clans. In Monstrosity, our gold resource is the default currency used in core city buildings, city defenses, as well as for construction of power generation and storage buildings. Power is used in anything that directly influences our in-game units, the monsters, as well as to build gold generators and banks. We wanted to avoid unnecessary unbalance with our two resources. From the perspective of a player, when two resources with similar function are distributed, it's easier to accept them being of similar value even though they're used for distinctly different purposes. It also makes design much cleaner, so we set a value of total expenditure over lifetime that was the same for both. Now that's a mouthful, but what I basically mean is that the amount that we want the player to have spent on both resources over the course of the game should in theory work out to be the same for each milestone. The total amount before the player has everything and has done everything necessary to get to each milestone. In the case of Monstrosity, this is going to mean the net cost of all of our buildings, as well as the lifetime cost of our monsters and their upkeep, and all other resource sinks. For now, though we have two resources, let's just look at our gold only, to avoid overloading on information. So we have a resource, which is the base unit that we'll be dealing with to gain our progression and define our balance. Next, we need to define the variable to end all variables, time. We want to use time here to say roughly how long we want it to take for a player to reach our maximum expenditure of gold in ideal conditions. Let's say that we want our players to be able to complete the game in ideal conditions in about 15 months of play. As we're looking at a build and battler, that's not so outrageous a number as we're looking at 10 minute sessions a few times a day over the course of that year and change. We're creating something a player can enjoy on their downtime for a long time, hopefully without getting bored while still feeling forward progression. We began by looking at roughly 170 million gold spent over our game's lifetime. Over time that evolved a bit, certain things were removed or deprioritized to get us to a less rounded number, but for all intents and purposes, this is our sweet spot, 170 million over 15 months. With our baseline endpoint set, we set a few milestones in between. For these games, it's usually the city hall that defines the main content gates, so we defined our milestones at each of the 10 city hall levels and defined the time and cost for each. Final balance numbers will always be more nuanced and much less clean, but we began by defining a reasonably smooth curve of half a day to complete level 1, finish level 2 at a day and a half, then 3 days, 2 weeks, a month and a half, 3 months, 6 months, 300 days, and finally 15 months total to complete our starting content, which would give us time to add more. Our cost burn curve is fairly nuanced as it underwent a few changes over the time that we spent as a team in balancing. Feeling out the game's various levels in a controlled environment and raising or lowering values to find a balanced sweet spot that ramps cost at levels where we introduce large parts of game content. 
We began our cost burn ratios at a much smoother 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, 5. But as always, after testing, these numbers changed drastically to reflect actual game experience. Once we had these values, we were in a good shape to see what our costs should look like. If there was only one building and no other costs, we'd have been done, but since our resources are distributed over a large number of costs and income sources, we needed to subdivide. As we said before, our gold is spent on buildings primarily. We further subdivided those structures into core and defense buildings, and as this is a build and battle type game, we also budgeted for a daily loss through combat value, how much we think that the player should be losing per day to other players. So we have to define a ratio between these expenditures in order to find a starting point for gold expenditure. Say we wanted our core and economy buildings to be 10% of our total per milestone expenditure, defense to be 70%, and loss to other players to be about 20%. We plug these values into our costs, and we get our budgets per level for each. We want, however, to create a zero-sum equation. We know where we want the gold to go, but we also have to define where it comes from. In Monstrosity, we define 26% from resource generators, 62% from rewards for attacking, a total 2% from the game's campaign mode, and 10% from participating in Syndicate Wars, which is one of our major social features. As you can see, we had other columns for crates and rampages, but we ultimately removed core resources from both of those and decided that they should exclusively drop DNA, the resource used to unlock and upgrade your city's monsters. On the side of expenditures, buildings being one-time upgrade costs, it's mostly a matter of choosing a ratio of cost for each building at each level within its budget, but every game is different hopefully, and even adding or removing one building has a cost ripple effect which should be considered. As a building's maximum level potentially increases, existing buildings need only one level of upgrade, but a new building added at that level of the same type, say an extra turret or a gold generator, will also require the cumulative cost of all previous levels as well. You can't divide evenly among each building per level, you'll probably want to create a cost matrix that can do this for you, like this one. With every upgrade or new building, we get a total amount of cost, which helps us to fine-tune the total cost for each building level, while factoring in the budget per level and how many buildings we'll have available to us per that city hall milestone. You'll notice a fairly hefty deficit in many of our buildings, a product of needing to balance mathematical perfection with player perception. The same method was used to calculate how much of each resource should be generated at each building per day. By calculating our desired daily income, by dividing total budget by days to milestone, and then fine-tuning production rates and number of buildings in order to match without creating too much of a per-level deficit. In all of these cases, it was a balancing act of ensuring that we came close to our numbers while still creating a player experience that didn't feel needlessly grindy. Where it came time to fudge numbers to fit in our budget, we always erred on the side of player experience, keeping a mantra of always fun, minimize the grind, and keep the core loop moving. We recognized of course from the start that as a build-in battle game, there was going to be a fair amount of time gating that would have to happen, but we wanted each day still to feel like there was forward momentum and that the combat was still a central focus, even to the detriment of the economy if needs be, as long as things didn't break entirely. As is the case with any game, as I've mentioned before, mathematical perfection is rarely fun or satisfying to the player. While this spreadsheet has gone a long way to inform our design, the design still rules the spreadsheet as opposed to the other way around, and it also lets us know when a change stands to have a largely detrimental effect on our economy and total lifetime, which is the best use for something like this, early detection. This sheet allowed us to define how much each campaign mission should be worth, how many resources to award as rewards based on assumptions of player's skill and behavior, and how even to gate attacking. How much of the player's stored resources should be available to an attack in order to achieve our goals while using analytics tools and chasing the meta to further fine tune and monitor player behaviors to get the just the right number of attacks and adjust our attack gates or wake queue accordingly. It's a very useful tool that allowed us in only a month or two to create a working economy without making the big mistake of just copying someone else's, which leaves you beholden to their design decisions as opposed to your own. And that wraps up our quick but deep dive into the nuts and bolts of a living new mobile games economy. 
I hope that you found it educational and perhaps useful in getting an idea for how you might use macro balancing techniques illustrated in the last two videos to create a number of great things. Next week, I'd like to take a look at class role archetype balancing and how the so-called holy trinity of game character archetypes inform game design. But until then, thank you as always for joining me in this week's episode. If you aren't already a subscriber to our show, you're welcome to join our little family of gamers who love both playing and making games. Even if you decide to keep us at arm's length, though, I do hope that you'll join us again next time. Thank you again, and take care.